The basic theme of the less sophisticated is that China, not as at war with us, but certainly has a different political system and has a new robust offense. Can they use renminbi as a weapon? It, can you weaponize a currency? Look, they view themselves as doing very well, and they're not looking to rock the boat. Their technocrats have been telling them for two decades almost now, you really should have an inflation targeting regime like everybody else. Let us be a little bit more independent central bank. We can keep things stable. We shouldn't be following around the dollar for lots of reasons. Uh, the politicians have said, you know, things are going great. Let's not do that. Uh, they are looking at the longer run, and they thoroughly intend for the renminbi first to be co-equal with the dollar, at least with the euro, and maybe eventually take over. Uh, if we look at a long enough horizon, China continues to rise, that'll be hard to stop. But I, I don't think they're looking to do anything quickly. That said, they put out this new Di uh, starting put out a new digital central bank currency, which certainly has the seeds of being able to replace the dollar. Ken, as you see things right now, what do you think is the biggest threat to dollar hegemony? Is it a decision that America could make or a decision that could be made elsewhere? I, I think it would come from, you know, a shock to the system. The dollar hegemony is not something that's going to go away overnight. Typically, when you get on top, you keep it for a century or more. We've had it for a century. Uh, certainly since world, the end of World War I. Uh, so it's, it's, but on the other hand, if you're, let's say, piling up 60% of the global public and corporate debt uh, in the world, as the U.S. is sort of doing, it just dominates uh, debt issuance markets, and you're counting on that, and that can't go away quickly, it's a fragility. And the late Emmanuel Farhi, together with uh, Matteo Maggiore at Stanford, Farhi was my colleague, uh, wrote this wonderful paper about, you know, the hegemon is tempted to push things, to take advantage of this exorbitant privilege and create fragility that might be a reasonable calculus for the United States, but not for the world as a whole. So when we talk about that fragility right now, Ken, where's the biggest source of it, do you think? Do you think it is in the debt market? Boy, um, well, certainly if interest rates went up, I just it would turn the world upside down. I think we'll find out a lot when Europe gets out of this. When the vaccines come, that's really the biggest difference between the U.S. and Europe. The vaccines come as long as Europe, which is all, roughly as big as the United States, is sort of stuck in the mud. It's very hard to tell what's going on with global interest rates, what's going on with inflation. So I think I think the U.S. has a while to run before that happens. But when it does, I, I don't know what's next. Obviously, this has been a very hard pandemic to call, particularly because the <laughs> Uh, wa waves of it and the vaccines have been vastly more successful than I think almost anyone expected.